You know, one thing I, I definitely uh, find important in my life is to remember the people who have made the most difference in my life. I suspect we all have people who have been like heroes to us in our own personal lives. And we have heroes, people we look up to uh, in, in history that we look to and say, these are the people that we need to remember most because they model something for us that we can do in our own life. I would love to have us all gather in a room and talk about who are those heroes in our own personal lives and who are the heroes in history to you that you look up to that you find virtue from. Uh, one of my heroes, at least the one from history, would be uh, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was an amazing man. He was a man who was going one direction, persecuting Christians, and in a flash of light, in a conversion, he turned completely the opposite direction. And for the next 20-something years, he went around the Roman Empire, uh, meeting with people and, and finding and founding new churches and bringing people to this wonderful faith that he had discovered that, that made everything into his heart. We find him today doing just that. He goes to the city of Athens. Athens is one of the great centers of religion in pagan times. It was a place where pagan religions prospered. There was gods and goddesses and statues and temples everywhere, like the same as there would be in Rome. There were also philosophers of different philosophical traditions, some of whom Paul clearly respected. But Paul went there. And he went to the place where philosophers would go and stand and speak their philosophy or speak their faith and have other people challenge it and ask questions of it. And he spoke a remarkable sermon, one of the most remarkable sermons we have recorded in the scriptures. He speaks to these people and he begins by doing a smart thing that good speakers do. He complimented the people. So I've been wandering around your city and I've noticed you've got temples for every god and every goddess and and you are a very religious people. You must be very open people to have this many gods and goddesses that you're, that you're worshiping. And uh, he said, I also noticed that you had a, a platform, a, a place uh, for an unknown God. Now, what Paul was talking about was that uh, ancient people, pagan religions, primarily thought religion was about appeasing the gods, giving an offering, doing a good thing, uh, trying to get on their good side rather than being have them angry with you and try to get their favor. Cities did that. The Roman Empire did that. That's why it was so important for everyone to worship the altars and the holidays. So Rome would keep its position. The gods would bless Rome. Not to do it would be to betray Rome. And that was pretty much their image. But they wanted to make sure, apparently in Athens, that they didn't overlook any god, so they had this all because they needed an insurance that they hadn't gotten some other god they don't know really mad at them. And so Paul said, I can tell you the secret of who that god is. That god is a god who is above everything. That god is a god who is in and beyond everything. That is the one who has created everything and sustains everything everything. It is the Lord of creation, the Lord of life. You don't take a breath. The breath you take now comes from that God. This is not a God who needs a temple to be kept in. This is not a God who, who can be found in stone, even if it's beautiful stone. This is a God far, far beyond our imagination. This is a God, he said, in whom we move and have our being. He said, that's what one of your philosophers said, wasn't it? That God is one in whom we move and have our being. And I've always loved that image because it says, God is everywhere around me and within me. God is the one in whom I operate like a fish in water. Someone told me recently that the image really refers to what it's like to be in your mother's womb. Because in your mother's womb, a baby is... The mother is everywhere. The fluids are everywhere. They cover, they're inside, they, they provide, they nourish everything that you need. And that's what it's like to be with God. God is one in whom we dwell, and who surrounds us within us, provides us everything that we need. What a wonderful image Paul gave. And Paul says uh, to these people that this is a God greater than the smallness the way you usually see God. This is, in effect, what he was saying to them. And I think he must have had them.
But then he went further because he couldn't end there. He said, now the great God, the one true God of all things, all cre creation, of all principalities and powers, that one God, that one God is forgiving your ignorance. You've been ignorant, and God's going to let that pass, but the time of ignorance is over. Now is the time to repent and turn a different direction to this new God. Because there is one who is here that he has sent to judge all people, and this one who was sent has been resurrected from the dead, and it's at that point that he loses them. They begin to jeer and laugh, and some begin to go away. But a few, we're told, a few accepted and understood his message. It's a wonderful story. It says a lot of things. For one thing, it affirms that God is present in the life of other people. It affirms the insights and validity of other religions, uh, that, there, that there is a closeness to people. But most of us think about Paul preaching this sermon, and we don't really like hearing it because we think, well, Paul is, you know, he's trying to convert these pagan people and tell them how their religion is wrong and how there's one true religion, and, and their religion has nothing to do with it. And um, God can seem like that to many people. So many people, Christians I have met, who said, you know, I, I couldn't be Christian if I had to think that Christianity were the only way that all the other religions were false and that we were the only ones. I said, why is that the case? They said, well, it wouldn't be Christian to think that. It's condescending. It's judgmental. It imagines that we possess God rather than God possesses us, that we have control and that we can use fear and intimidation to make people come to our point of view. Well, I happen to have, hold that that's a very Christian view to think that. Paul's message to, the, um, to those uh, who worship the gods and goddesses was basically a message saying God is far bigger than any of us ever imagined. A God who is uh, beyond our pettiness, our small-mindedness, our, our wanting to control God and have God in our pockets or on our shelves. That when we need something, we appease that God and ask for what we want and will give us what we want. God is far bigger than that. So I want to invite you to think about this scripture in a different way. Don't think about it as Paul condescending and putting down other religions. Think of it as Paul critiquing every religious view that makes God small when God is really very big, that makes God limited to one aspect of life or to my own personal life as opposed to caring for the whole. Our God is a magnificent God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is extravagant in his love beyond anything that we think we imagine. We think we understand the limits of God's love. We've made a bad mistake. Paul says it over and over. Chapter 13 in Corinthians. No one really knows the depth and the height of God's love for us. And that is the good news of what Paul is telling us. You know, if Paul were to come back now, wouldn't it be great if you could have one time, say, Paul, you can come back, where would you go? You think he would go speak to the Buddhists, or go speak to the Hindus, or go speak to the Jews, his own people, and try to convert them? No, I think Paul would begin with the Christian church. I think we have come to have a rather small-minded uh, image of God. We're always in danger of this, turning God into something we control. The very idea that sometimes we think that God loves us and our nation and our way of life. God bless America, but not everyone else. But God is the God of all people, the God of all nations, above any point of view, any way of life. Sometimes we think God is my own personal God. I know when I was in theology school, um, I came out of evangelical uh, Christian tradition and I knew God's great love for me. I knew that God had forgiven me, that um, God would be with me always. The things that, the core things we all need to know. But I had a very restrictive view. I felt like I had Jesus in my heart and I didn't want Jesus to get outside my heart. Jesus was right here. I didn't have the expansive view that Paul understood until I came to theology school and they began to read the scriptures and really understand the depth of theology and the depth of the scriptures and how God is greater than anything I'd ever imagined. And when I understood that, 
my small way of living with God expanded to include especially the poor and the dispossessed. I understood that God was special as the God of those who were the outsiders. You know, there's uh, one of my professors who was really helpful with this was uh, my preaching, one of my preaching professors, Fred Craddock. Fred Craddock was, um, at one time, had been a student pastor up in, uh, up in Tennessee. He was up in Oak Ridge at the time that the nuclear power plants and nuclear industry was, was cranking up at that point in that area of the country. He served a little small church. The church had been built by its own people. The building itself, the, the, the pews had been hand-hewn, uh, by them. The organ was one of the treasured items they had in that church and they would meet on Sundays and he would preach. And one Sunday he said, you know, we have all these people who've moved in together in trailers. Just, there's a trailer park near us because they're all new people working to build the, the power plants. He said, I think we ought to go evangelize and reach out and see if they want to come to our church. And the people said, one person said, oh, no, Pastor. Pastor, those, those people aren't like us. They, they won't feel comfortable in our place. And besides, they're not going to be here very long, you know. Why waste our time? But we'll bring it up. We'll talk about it next week, Pastor. Next week came. They convened a meeting. A man stood up, made a motion. I make a motion that anyone who wants to be a member of our church needs to be a property-owning people in this county. And someone else seconded, and the church approved it. Fred voted against it. He said, well, sorry, you can't get to vote for it, Pastor, because you don't have a vote. You're a student, for one thing, and you're our pastor. Well, as years later, he and his wife were back in that area. The area had grown up a lot since then. How we had gone through, he had a tough time finding the church, wanted to show it to his wife. He did find it down at the end of a gravel road. And it looked just like the old church, except the pine trees around it had gotten much bigger. And he noticed that there was a sign on the church. It said barbecue. And that whole parking lot was filled with cars and trucks for that restaurant. He said to his wife, well, we might as well go in and get something to eat. And I'll show you the rest of the church and see what it's like. They go in and the place is crowded. Those pews, beautiful pews are along the side of the walls, places for people to sit. There are people eating barbecue over by that great organ the church admired so much. And he looked out and saw all the people. There were people in shorts and torn blue jeans and workers who were dirty from a day's work. There were people in suits and ties. There were people of different races. There were people from all over gathered in that church. And he looked to his wife and he said, well, it's a good thing this isn't a church anymore, or else these people couldn't be here. Sometimes we think of God being awful small, and God is big. God is the one in whom we move and have our being. May we come to trust in that God. May we come to allow Paul and others to challenge at any time we try to make God smaller than God really is. Amen.